Good evening. My name is Erin Gallagher, and I first want to thank Police Chief Hayes and all of your team who have been here. Uh, you've done a, a formidable job keeping us all safe, organized in traffic. Attorney Silverman, I'm going to stick my head right in the lion's mouth and say I support you. I think you're doing a great job, and I appreciate the work that you've done. I've said it privately. I'm saying it publicly now. I don't envy you, gentlemen, this task. My name is Erin Gallagher, and I don't live in Elwood, but I am a steelman. I'm not from Jackson Township, but I have been squawked at by Betty Hibner for not leading Trump to my partner. I don't live in the village of Manhattan, yet I have perfected my gutter ball at Stone City. By all rights, I don't have a dog in this fight, but I'm here because I'm among the many people who live between 55 and 57, south of 80, who will be directly impacted by this unprecedented truck facility. It's also important to note that I'm here as a private citizen. While it's true that I've helped the cold waters issue a press release to help keep media away from them, all the research I'm about to show you, everything that I have done to, to show you tonight, I've done on my own dime with no financial support. There are no hidden agendas. Nobody has promised me so much as a ham sandwich. And I'm going to ask everybody to please be quiet because if you'd like me to finish, we need to get through this. Mr. Robinson, you and I have spent some time talking, probably um, I've asked a lot of different questions from you and you've given me some answers and I've been longing for other answers. And I believe you're Ian McDonald, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So you're the author of the Memorandum of Understanding that asked for the village to issue uh, involuntary annexation for the cold waters. You're the author of that memo? I'm the author. Okay. It's nice to put a name with a face. I've been spending a lot of time kind of on the sidelines trying to understand this project and like many of the people here and probably many of you, there have been a lot of confusing information and a lot of uh, what I'm going to call a shell game. So I've decided that um, because I can, I'm going to try to help debunk some of the facts, and I will promise I will skip over as much as anybody has already said. Mr. Robinson, you have repeatedly testified that the mayor of Edgerton is someone that we can talk to and that the role model in Edgerton, Kansas, is a uh, role model for success. And so I decided to take you up on your advice, and I flew my butt down to Kansas to find out for myself. <laughs> Everybody, please. Now, I've been told that you can't have audio, so I'm going to try to hold this up so you can hear the testimony that these people have given me. I have interviewed this first one is the Gardner City Council member, Rich Melton, and he wants to talk to you about uh, the difference between Gardner, which is the neighboring city, and Edgerton. By the way, I was told I couldn't do this, but I decided I wasn't going to be silenced. If you could turn that up, please. I'm sorry, she can't, the recorder can't hear that. Can you just summarize what it is he's saying for us? Not really. Is there no way that this can be turned up? Turn this volume up here. 
Can you hold on just a second? Um, is, is there an objection to the testimony? Is that it? Yeah, we'll object to the testimony. Okay. Look, can we just have a conversation down here, Mr. please? I, are you objecting to the... Yeah, Mr. Silverman, we have witnesses here, and pursuant to the case law for our public hearing and the rules, we, we, need, we have not cross-examined any witnesses. We've listened to them, and we want to respond. But when we bring in somebody on a videotape that we have no ability to talk to, it, it's just not quite fair. I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Right. Commissioner, I, uh, Chairman, I don't hear you, please. I'm sorry. What was that you said? I, I, mean, I thought you were asking me a question. Yeah, this is your testimony and your opportunity to ask questions. So you're saying I cannot play the I'm video? Not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, sure. first of all, okay? So... How would you like me to proceed, sir? Can you, can you, can you, can you please, please be quiet? That is enough. How would you like me to proceed? Why I would you? like, I would like you to, I would like you to summarize what the man said, if you could. I, if you've got, like, we're, we're, we're trying to enter new. New testimony. New testimony. I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to summarize for you. It'll actually be a little bit faster, but I don't know if it can be as accurate. But I'm more than happy to say what I think what he said. Is, to summarize what he's saying for you in my own just, testimony. Just summarize what he said. The, okay. You know, the commission can, can okay, give, so give the, the, can, the commission then can give the appropriate weight to the testimony, and the applicants can also cross-examine her based upon the testimony. So I think we're okay. So what they're saying here is we have residential homes that are built right up next to these areas, okay? And I'll give you an example. This is my own video here. So on the left, you'll see my finger. That is Gardner, and on the right is Edgerton. So this is all Edgerton, Kansas here. So that berm that you're seeing to prevent water from going into Edgerton is right up literally adjacent to the border of Gardner, Kansas. And so what I'm doing here, excuse me, what I'm doing here is I'm showing you this area between the two cities is actually completely flooded by Edgerton and North Point's berm. And these people who live in this house, whom I've spoken to, have told me that not only is their backyard flooded, but also their basements are flooded. They are also dealing with loud trucks. They are also dealing with the idling truck noises. And they are also dealing with very, very bright lights. And that is how close these berms are being built to these cities. And what the testimony that I heard from several people, not just the, the um, city council member that I just referenced, but there were multiple people who told me that because it is in two different cities, the answer that Gardner receives from the people in Edgerton is, we don't care. It's not in our town. Deal with it. And by the way, as far as I understand, Gardner receives no tax benefits, no financial funding, no supplementing from North Point whatsoever. That's what everybody has told me. Mr. Robinson, is that accurate? Look, I have worked in the Gardner Edgerton area on legit. Look. Please let him answer so that I can continue. Right. Look, I, there are always two sides to the story, is what I will say. I worked in Gardner from 2007 to 2010. We were annexed into the city of Gardner, and then we were subsequently de-annexed. And, and we uh, were invited to join uh, the, the city of Edgerton. So, so I, would, I would also offer, I mean, you referenced Mayor Roberts. Mayor Roberts actually called me today and said he would be happy to produce himself at one of these hearings whether it be here or the village. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that, but how do you answer my question? Okay. And my question again, So the again, question please. was, does Gardner receive any revenue from this development, correct? Uh, the Consolidated School District USD, USD 231 does, but from a municipal governance perspective, uh, no, absolutely not. All of our taxes Actually, go. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Actually, what I heard from the superintendent and the state representative was that the school 
actually receives 20, got screwed out of $27 million because they were not allowed a seat at the table. Again, if that's a question, I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, it. Okay, uh, then I'll if, continue. If you, look, if you want to know the full history of USD, USD 231, there have been two superintendents since I've been working on this project. The first one, Dr. Bill Gilhouse, uh, was unlawfully uh, fired. There was a $1.8 million settlement with him in the, uh, among many applic uh, allegations that were made. Um, in my most recent meeting with the superintendent from USD 231, she asked me to make direct payments uh, to Gardner Edgerton, we, uh, USD 231. We said that we'd be happy to do that. And then on the advice of bond council, uh, what we were told is that it would violate stat state statutes. And uh, I know there were prior allegations, but believe it or not, we don't break the law and we have no intention of doing it. And so we are who we say we are. We're not going to do that. We play a clean game. We'll and get to uh, that. so I was unwilling to make the direct payments that she requested. So you were unwilling to pay the school district. Got it. I was unwilling to do it, make okay. an illegal payment. We, we make 70% uh, of the payments that we make uh, go to the school district. Yeah. So now I'm talking to uh, this gentleman is Fred Fraley. He's an electrician and he is a farmer from Gardner, are, Kansas. Are you going to tie this into Elwood somehow? I'm going, well, I'm responding to the, yes. Yes, I will. Thank you. So what we're seeing from this gentleman, and I will make it available, uh, these testimonies and audio and everything available on my website if anybody cares to see or hear what they actually have to say. But what Fred Fraley is saying here, and it's really unfortunate you can't hear him because the tone of this man's voice uh, is, is what convinced me to go down to Kansas. And after meeting with him and after talking with the political officials and elected officials and the people in the restaurants and the business owners and the people in the bars in both Edgerton and in Gardner, I can say that after learning what they had told me, I came home and sat on my bed and I cried. What is happening to these people is unbelievable and it is unstoppable. This man said that he had an 80 acre parcel and it was a hay field. And in his 80 acre parcel, North Point built all around him and he said, this was my dream to have and to hold for my family and pass it on. And North Point created their dream, which forced me out. And I want everybody who was involved, and they were talking specifically, he was addressing this to you, to take a very close look. I think he said, everybody who was involved with it to just look very closely. North Point will tell you one thing and mean another, and it will be disastrous to some and beware. And he also told me I, he didn't understand why I was down there because he said North Point is so big that they are going to push this through no matter what. And that he said he had two attorneys and two expert uh, engineers to show and demonstrate the flooding that happened to his 80 acre parcel as a result from North Point's development. And he said, I couldn't even, I couldn't even compete. Did Mr. Fraley tell you that he's been sued by the city for illegally uh, filling in the floodplain on that same 80 acre parcel? I have no idea what you're talking about, but I can tell you that I have other people who support him if you'll allow me to finish. So the retention system was built for failure. I had, I can't tell you how many people I had say to me that the retention systems were a farce. And not just one, sir, but multiple people tell me, and I am saying this under oath, hand before God. According to Fred Fraley, after North Point flooded his field, he offered to sell 80 acres to them for $32,000, which was half the price of the surrounding acreage. North Point was buying land at 62. He offered 32 and was declined. And because the land was already flooded, he ended up selling his land for $17,000 an acre for an 80-acre parcel, and he did it after paying an attorney, two attorneys, 
after paying two engineers to try to fight this. And here's what happened. He said, I realized I couldn't stop him and I just needed to get out from under. And here is a picture, the drone, the southern half or the bottom half of the picture, the green area. For those of you who are used to looking at agriculture photos, you can see that that flooding has come. You could see where it's pooled up and swelled to the north of that, that center line there and then continues down. Look, this, we're looking at these slides. These are getting awfully personal. Let's, let's try to keep to the facts and try to keep. All right, all right. So this is, you're not gonna be able to hear him, but this is, excuse me. This is the new mayor of Gardner, and he's demonstrating what the retention ponds look like. So here is a, an example of North Point's um, development. And then over it to the left, and I, when I was doing this, it was just me and my little iPhone camera. I wasn't aware what he was going to do. So I was trying to kind of chase him around, but the bottom line is he's going to show us where the retention ponds are, and then he's gonna show us the big four foot drainage pipes that go in from the left of the screen to the right of the screen and go down into farmer Fred Fraley's retention or into his field. So you can tell whether you're at the bottom of the field or at the top of the field, you can tell where the water is coming from. This is what I found when I went to Edgerton. Edgerton's retail consists of everything that you see right here. It is a gas station, a liquor, tobacco store that are adjacent to each other, and a bar. Let me quickly throw, show you some of these houses in Edgerton. And this is what is considered the business district. This is downtown Edgerton. These are just random in no particular order and no particular ph photographic skill. In my opinion, Edgerton does not reflect a multi-billion dollar community. It reminded me of 53 south of Wilmington when you're heading out of town. That's what I felt like when I was there. So this uh, Rich Melton, sorry I cut your video with your eyes shut there, sir, but um, Rich Melton is also a realtor and one of the things he explained was that the property values between Gardner, Kansas, and Edgerton, Kansas are really substantial. A three bedroom, two bath house in Gardner, Kansas runs about uh, 170 to 230, but in Edgerton, where all of this development has occurred, it runs about 110 to 150 for the same three bedroom, two bath house. I wish you could hear this because this gentleman spent a lot of time, these, there, were, there were a number of men, and not just these folks, but a number of men and women who took me around and showed me and pointed. But what he's saying here is that the money that was being invested was also being reinvested into North Point. So the dollars, all of these tax benefits, were not going to the residents where people live. They were going back into more North Point structure. I also like to point out that the capital improvement projects that were presented in the Ehlers study, uh, so many of these, you've got $10 million, and so many of these are relying upon the fact that North Point comes in. I can tell you that the second one, South Chicago from Hoff to Manhattan, isn't even in the village limits and yet you've got it organized as a major project for capital improvements, and you are counting it toward this big, looming, scary phantom debt. Well, $10 million of it would not be debt if you did not have North Point. And I think that you need to tell the staff to go back and get more options. And as far as South Chicago from Hoff to Manhattan is concerned, I think that the cold waters are gonna have something to say about that.
So here are two neighboring cities that used to get along that now don't. The population of Edgerton is substantially smaller than Gardner. Edgerton is annexed 100%, 100% and Gardner has none. There is a huge difference in the price of houses and the retail between the two businesses uh, is substantial as well. Edgerton has essentially nothing and Gardner has a Walmart, hotels, many restaurants, several fast food restaurants, very different. Some key differences between Edgerton and Elwood. I did promise I'd get around to Elwood. 1,700 acres and growing. It's my understanding that you just announced that you are uh, intention to annex more property on the south of 35. That's correct. That happened when we were here uh, last Thursday. And what I would say is that's a continuation of a successful partnership. If we're yeah. such a bad partner for Edgerton, why would they do another 575 acres with us? Put a pin in that because I'll get back to you. What I'm saying here, though, is that when you're taking a look at jumping the highway, Shanahan, you better look out. Edgerton is also not a closed loop. There is nothing about that property, and I have driven it for hours on two separate occasions, the entire property. There is no closed loop there. So this... So this is a drone video that was um, taken for the village of, or for the city of Gardner. Gardner has had so many traffic problems as a result of North Point that they are incurring intense, costly upgrades, including this, which is uh, the intersection of I-35. You'll see it from the right of the screen. The cars pile up, and you can see there they're trying to turn left. So they're turning right and a quick left in onto the frontage road. This was taken uh, by an independent third party and presented to the city of Gardner in an effort to determine what the costs would be to replace and repair and improve this interchange. So the result of North Point being good neighbors is very costly to the people who are on the other side of that stick. So this is the famous bridge, and they call it in town the bridge to nowhere, and I laugh because it really does begin with a road from hell. The bridge comes over and over one set of railroad tracks, but there are actually two sets of railroad tracks. And if you look at this video, this road is in awful disrepair. This is a terrible gravel road, and in the top left of the screen, you see my photo of the big pothole that is a huge pothole that would break an axle and I had to drive around it but now you're on the the bridge and the problem with the road is you'll see that there is no shrubbery there is no archway there is no entrance there is no closed loop this is what happens that that road is so terrible before the bridge because it is a multi-jurisdictional Edgerton and Gardner boundary in Kansas. And that is what happens when parties are left out of the discussion. So you're seeing now here you're over the bridge, nothing. You got roads in and out on both sides. You see no archways. You see no closed loop. I mean, there, there are in the park, once you get in and back and around, see there's another intersection with no, no archway or closed loop designation. There are a couple of roads that kind of dead end within the facility, and in that sense, yes, I guess one might say that would be a closed loop, but by and large, you can drive north or south, east to west, and see nothing. There's no shrubbery here. There's no beautiful landscaping. This is what you're going to get. I'm just going to stop this video here because there's nothing more to it. Now, I know that we've had some discussions about truck traffic, and I understand that you disagree with the 
trans system traffic study, but the reason why I'm choosing to cite this one as opposed to studies that have trucks that are just going over the bridge is that I think we need to take a look at the entire area, and that's what this study does. It suggests 22,400 trucks a day and 30,000 trucks a day and in the entire area of Baseline Road, and that is exactly the same road that they're proposing trucks will go along. So we need to get serious about some numbers. There are different numbers in different ways. There are different ways to skin this cat, and a lot of them have to do with where. Trucks over the bridge, ah, 10,000. Trucks down this road, 15,000. Well, this is an actual study of a broader perspective, and I think that that needs to be taken into consideration. Somebody else mentioned this, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but if everybody can take a deep breath. And that's every day. So here, we've already talked about this. I won't go over it. They've already admitted that uh, there will be trucks on 53, despite everything that they've said in the past about keeping trucks off 53. And there's nothing safe roads about that. So let's take a look at pesky employees. This comes from uh, an FAQ sheet that they released earlier this summer, last summer. They're talking about 15,000 full-time jobs in cars, plus another 17,000 for what they've classified as indirect jobs at full build-out. Nobody's had the discussion about part-time jobs. So we're looking at another roughly 32,000 cars daily. And those are cars that are not going to be impacted by the closed loop. So 22.25 cars per minute plus whatever part-time. So again, this is the picture of Gardner, Kansas, backed up for miles with 21 trucks and 22 cars per minute every day. One bridge cannot possibly be the answer. Every single town will be impacted by this. This is unprecedented. I've heard this rumored, or I've heard this discussion, I think, on the first night about the arsenal traffic has always been there. Uh, Jim Moustis was quoted in the Daily South Town, traffic has always been there. Let's take a look at that. Medea Wynn Heritage Association says that at construction, they had 17,000 employees. They are estimating about 5,000 cars when they were carpooling. The high peak of employment was over 20,000 in July of 1942. And I have to get a giggle out of this. A familiar scene at night, this is a newspaper clipping from, I believe, the early 1940s, probably 1941 or 1942. A familiar scene at night and morning on Route 66 and 66A, which by the way, you're messing with a historical road too between Joliet and the two munitions plants was, that traf was traffic congestion. It has been estimated that as many as 5,000 cars a day have gone in, into, and returned from the two ordnance plants during the peak of construction. 5,000 a day during the peak of construction. That is absolutely nowhere near what we're talking about. Nowhere near. And what happens when 2,500 women begin driving back, to, back and forth to the munitions plants? Scary thought. We grow up and get educated and able to come back here and talk to you. Please, if I may continue. The deadly statistics. This is another multi-jurisdictional mess. This is my photograph. North Point funded traffic counts did not include one of the deadliest intersections in Will County and is right out the back door in its Kirstein's Curve. In 2017, there were three fatalities. In 2015, there was a single fatality, and in 2014, there was a double fatality. And I have to tell you, I was on site for all of those crashes. It is not pretty being the first person to arrive on the scene. This particular photo was not one of those fatalities, however. I chose not to include any photos from the, the fatal crashes because there were people likely in this room tonight who were involved and I didn't want to disrespect them or the people who died. So instead, this is a photo of a woman who she and her three children 
were all transported to Silver Cross Hospital with what I have come to understand were, were non-life-threatening injuries. There have been so many crashes there, and if we're going to take a look at traffic counts and statistics, we need to take a look at the big, bad, nasty that's right at our back door. So when you're talking, talking about 21 trucks and 22 cars a minute, traffic pressure will likely impact so many more locations than just 53. And this is based on my numerous discussions with people in Kansas, as well as what happened at the i Ainey rush meeting that Scott Slocum from WJOL hosted, thankfully. Another thing, directional lighting. That means say goodbye to stars. We've heard Mr. George, is that your name, sir? Mr. George? We've heard Mr. George say that the directional lighting on warehouses is so very different than the intermodals and it's not comparable. So I've included photos from directional lighting here so you can see how bright it really is. Shalimar, this is what you have to look forward to. An example of directional lighting as seen by the neighbors next door. This is about, a, I'm guessing it's, um, I'm not sure if it's a mile and a half away, but it is the uh, warehouse as seen from an apartment complex. I have to laugh at model for success when it comes to uh, Edgerton's closed loop, because again, I saw nothing there that reflected a closed loop. Not, none of the pretty pictures, the, the drawings and the illustrations they provided to us were zero, big fat zero. Also, in the bottom of this, it says it generates valuable revenue that the city relies upon to operate and provide services to residents. Those services included trash, water, and sewer. Oh, and a senior lunch. They do a senior lunch in, in Edgerton as well. So these are all the areas indicated by the yellow, error, yellow arrows that I was able to access the closed, so-called closed loop with my little car. And there were many trucks right along with me. It, it's not a closed loop. And none of those pretty pictures. This is what I heard from a lot of people. We have been playing single A ball against a team of all stars. They referred to this as a fan dance, a strip tease. They are professionals at pitting cities against each other and they are experts. They can prove any point we want them to prove. And that's one of the things Mr. Fraley told me and other people told me repeatedly is, you're, you're flooding my land? No, we're actually subtracting water. So these are some of the things that, according to the people of Kansas, referred to when they talked about all-star skills. Deliberately separate communities. Seek out small, inexperienced village boards who willingly defer to their experts. I think one of the, one of the people actually used the word gullible. They become de facto village government, especially in economic development, and I have to say that I have experienced that when I called as a reporter when this uh, first uh, came to light and we were doing stories on it, I called the village and asked the people who answered the phone to speak with uh, either the village uh, administrator or the mayor to get the village's perspective on this. And they kept repeating to me that they were told that if I want the village's perspective, I have to call North Point's public relations person. I made three attempts to do that and finally I emailed um, Mrs. Gibson and did not get a response for a couple of days and uh, finally got a hold of the mayor. They reveal information in small incomplete, incomplete amounts, referring to it as a fan dance. I think we've established that their application here is incomplete. <clears throat> They ask planning and zoning to vote in increments without knowing all the facts. It's my understanding that you're here to vote on only a part of the entire project. Revision after revision of the annexation agreement contained fewer and fewer benefits to the town. You gotta keep a real close eye on everything. 
Rumors, scare tactics, convince people that they have no choices, seek approval on project in small stages so that they can later apply the, well, they're already here, we might as well keep going. Avoid community-wide discussions, seeking smaller format meetings to keep parties guessing and control information. Neighboring towns, townships, and school districts don't get a seat at the table. They bribe with heavy pre-funding, which cost village future excessive revenues, TIFs, and abatements. They're talking to me about 100% tax abatements and reoccurring. They bribe with heavy pre-funding, which costs the village or a city's future excessive revenues. Promise green space and community centers, which are still owned by North Point and can be developed at any time upon their pleasure, and that the promises are eventually fulfilled at their discretion. <clears throat> we have a lot of labor in the room tonight, and I just want to say uh, I'm very glad you're here. Uh, this is not an anti-labor discussion. In fact, I can tell you that in 1966, my father was drafted during the Vietnam War, and when he came back from the United States Army after serving for two years, there was not anybody who wanted him. Nobody wanted to give him a job because he was a service member, and he was fighting a war he didn't believe in anyway. But it was his union that got him his job back, and it was his union that got him his fair pay. And so if anybody ever again accuses me of being anti-union, I'm going to say that you need to say that to my face. These people in Kansas supported that they were afraid to talk on the record. They said vendors do not like working with North Point. Vendors' supervisors were threatening to quit because of their relationships with North Point. I was not able to track this down, but allegedly there was a shipment from concrete of concrete from St. Louis to undercut the cost. St. Louis is about 300 miles away, and they often referred to them using words like arrogant and difficult to work with, and we haven't experienced that at all, have we? <laughs> Iron workers, I believe this has already been brought to your attention about the, uh, the informal picket. The same thing about shame on North Point development. Uh, we've already brought this up. It says North Point development should apologize. I'm just curious, Mr. Robinson, you said you've been down there for 10 years. Did you apologize to the Carpies? Uh, what I will tell you is that this is a project in Wentzville, Missouri, and this was a result of a dispute between two local carpenters unions, uh, whether, whether and it was a jurisdictional issue. What I will tell you is that this project was delivered with 100% union labor because a promise made is a promise kept with us. Okay, so, so the answer is no? Look, I just told you that... Look, I'm just asking look, you if you apologized. This is beyond the headline. I don't know why I would apologize for a job where we committed to use 100% union labor and then we did. Okay, so we'll move on to the, the next union dispute. Uh, I don't believe this has been brought up. But it says, this is uh, actually written by the publisher of the Labor Beacon in the greater Kansas City area. The majority, if not all of the work, will be performed by non-union, by underpaid workers, many from out of town. North Point would do everything here non-union. They have no reason to help out in the community. They don't care if the wages they pay go to Texas or California. It is the bottom line. They have a set profit number. And if that can't be reached, guess what? Labor costs need to be cut. And you it know, got Ms. Gallagher, we really need to get on to your testimony. You're presenting a tremendous amount of what we would call hearsay testimony. Okay, so let and me it, just... And we, look, we have, to, we, we, we have to remember that we have to keep this hearing fair for both sides. I so respect, I understand. There's been I a will, lot of witnesses will... testify. Unfortunately, these people you're quoting aren't here tonight, so okay. give us your perspective, Well, I, I, and the reason I thought it was okay, because is that has been allowed before in this, in this. but Cer I will move, well, I will move Certainly faster. there's been some hearsay testimony presented. I think you're kind of setting the record, though. Oh, I accept that. So who really owns North Point? This source is the Secretary of State. North, North Point is owned by Kansas Corporation Number 2, and it's, owned by, it's organized by foreign money. 
these undisclosed foreign investors, and, and that's not uncommon as I understand, and, and you would probably know as well, that um, a foreign liability company does not need to designate where the money is coming from. So it could be coming from Canada or it could be coming from cartels. We don't have any way of knowing. So I can tell you that uh, this is a list of um, a variety of LLCs that have to be listed in affiliation with North Point Development uh, as part of the Kansas Corporation number two. And there were seven pages of company listings and North Point Development was number 23 of page five. And this is relevant. Patrick Robinson said last week that we like to partner with communities that we're in, and I think a number of folks here have talked to Mayor Roberts in Edgerton, where I've spent the last 10 years, and I think he would speak to the partnership approach that we have. Here's what I'm trying to say. When Edgerton Mayor Don Roberts ran for Kansas State Representative, it was one of the most heavily funded races in state history. All of the people shown here from, Ed, from North Point have maxed out their personal contribution campaigns to Edgerton Mayor Don Roberts for state representative, according to at least one of the campaign filings that I found. Now, the time frames vary uh, from state to state, so I can't articulate exactly how much or at what point. But at this, at this particular juncture, then all of the companies on the right, North Point, Edgerton Land Holdings, and all of these are all have the same address and have the same agent um, as North Point. And surprisingly, and really not surprisingly, at the bottom is uh, a St. Louis concrete company. So the point that I'm trying to make here, gentlemen, is that North Point is privately owned by undisclosed foreign ownership, there's no rail. It's 100% trucks. Unlike, we've been complaining a lot about another project in town, Center Point, but they are publicly traded. They are owned by a California pension fund, American money. They have intermodal with rail, and thank God for railroad. We need railroad. They are accountable to a board of directors and they also are accountable to the SEC. So when it talks about where does the buck stop, North Point, there is, there is, the buck does not stop. They're not accountable to anybody but themselves. And that was the main theme that I am bringing back to you from Kansas, is that they were not accountable to anybody but themselves. This is Kansas State Representative Bill Sutton and he talks about the art of the bad deal. I really wish that you could hear this because it's impressive, but what he basically says is, and he talks to each one of the four of you gentlemen, and he says, number one, keep everybody at the table. It is critical that everybody be having discussions. He says the school district lost $27 million and they had nothing to do with it because they were not at the table. He also said, pay attention to traffic. It's not just in one area, it's going to spread and spread and spread. And that traffic is critical and it's everywhere. And he said, you have to pay very close attention to it because it's a matter of life or death. I have to take a giggle at the graphic that says that there's no risk to taxpayers because the shared economic success is not displayed in Edgerton. If you ask who a North Point assumes all risk, don't talk to the school district because they will disagree. North Point pre-funds infrastructure, but at the expense of long-term 100% tax abatements plus TIFs, along with waiving building fees, tap-on fees, unknown other costs. And the problem here is that you don't know what they are. You haven't seen the finalized annexation, and this $10 million in capital improvement is only necessary if North Point comes in. I'm just going to let you read this for a minute. A yes vote means goodbye to stars forever. This debt is a smoke and mirrors fear tactic. Elwood has a moratorium on industrial, and there's a good reason for it. 
There's time to find something better, gentlemen. There is so much time to find something better. You have some looming debt, some tax payments you have to take responsibility for, but there are always, always, always options. And this project is wrong for Elwood. So I talked to the mayors of the neighboring communities and I said, we need to form a friendly boundaries coalition. And they agreed. So I think you can eliminate the fear that so-and-so is gonna come in and take over. Mayor of New Lenox, Tim Balderman said, yes, he will come to the table. Joliet Mayor Bob Odekirk told me personally, yes, he will come to the table. Manhattan Mayor Jamie Doyle has been working on this. Of course, he says yes. And Shanahan Mayor Missy Schumacher said yes. And Elwood Mayor Doug Jango, I welcome you to the table. We want to have everyone at the table. This is not a small thing. I'm at the end. This is the wrong project. It is most certainly the wrong developer. It is most certainly the wrong location. North Point is not a good neighbor. Excuse me, my last slide. The question then to the four of you is what kind of neighbor are you going to be? In Elwood, the buck stops with you. And the ultimate question is, what is your price? And I'm done.